Hi, thanks for joining us today. This is Matt Miller from Ditch That Textbook, and today we have Joe Marquez with us. He is a science teacher, and he's going to tell us a little bit more about himself. Uh, Joe and I met at the Google Teacher Academy in Austin, Texas. So, Joe, can you give us a little introduction about yourself? Yeah, Matt. Um, I am, uh, as you said, a science teacher at Alta Sierra Intermediate School. That's in Clovis, California, basically the Central Valley. Um, I'm also a instructional technology specialist on campus as well, um, trying to help out teachers install technology into the classroom. And um, I utilize utilize my classroom as kind of the uh, the test room, the test project. I I use my my students as uh, guinea pigs and s see what technology works, see what sticks, what doesn't, um, and then what does work. I take on to other classes and uh, we try it with their kids as well. And I like that because I'm I'm sort of in the same boat with my class. I I learn about other things and and sort of test it out in my class too. And you know sometimes it totally falls on its face, but sometimes it works. And you know I don't know about you, but that I mean that's kind of exciting to me. And my kids seem to be good with that. Are are yours about the same? Oh yeah, they love trying new things. You know if it doesn't work, they go ah that didn't work. We shouldn't do that again. I'm like okay, you know. And so you know it helps me understand what gets them motivated, what gets them engaged. Because, uh, you know, as we always say technology should be an enhancement to the instruction, not it shouldn't take over the instruction. So if, if the kids aren't buying in, then the uh, teachers aren't going to buy in as well. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, very good. So um, one of the things that, that you do that really fascinates me and I think uh, would probably fascinate a lot of other people is just how you've integrated Twitter into your classroom, using social media to connect with your kids inside of class and outside of class. So um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your inspiration on how you got, got into that in the beginning. Well, ever, ever since I started teaching, I, I knew that the cell phone in the classroom was going to be a huge part of my instruction. And early on, I did some, uh, some polls to see what would be the best way for students to uh, receive information from me, whether it would be uh, me telling it to them in class, whether it be me uh, emailing them or texting them. And four years ago, texting was the number one source of information they wanted to get. But now it's social media. Um, and, you know, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, these are all huge aspects of our students' lives. And I was trying to think to myself, how can I incorporate these more, not only outside of class to spread information, but inside class to enhance our instruction. And I was at a Q conference, and during the, uh, the keynote, um, I noticed the hashtag for the conference was just blowing up, and everybody was commenting on the speaker's, um, the speaker's um, ideas and inspirations. And I thought, hey, that'd be a pretty good way to get kids involved during my discussions is have them have a hashtag and have them talk about things and ask me questions that way. So um, I came back from that, uh, um, that conference and I tried it and it worked really well. And um, I received a, a pair of Google Glass and it became an even uh, larger part of my instruction because I can see their questions instantly right in my glass without skipping a beat. I can answer those questions and those students who are super shy and don't normally raise their hand, which is pretty much all of them because they are eighth grade students. Um, exactly. I saw a huge jump in engagement, especially between the, uh, the EL, the English learner population. Um, you know, they sit in the back and they're quiet and they just don't want to uh, talk because, you know, out of, out of fear that their, their accent's going to get in the way. Um, but they're the ones that have jumped on board with this uh, even more so than anybody else. So it's really exciting to see uh, these students who are normally shy and you don't even know who they are pop out and become uh, the most, I guess, vocal, you can say, during our Twitter conversations. Can you think, so just speaking of those um, those more reserved students that, that it really draws out, and I've, I've noticed the same thing with me. Um, I've used today's Meet Back channels before and have really pulled kids in that – you know, just wouldn't make a peep in, in class. And um, I was wondering, can you think of, I'm kind of putting you on the spot, I didn't didn't give you this ahead of time, but I bet you can probably think of at least maybe one example of a time you can think of, I mean, you've probably got a handful of kids that pop into mind when you think about this, but can you think of one example you can tell us about where um, having the social media ability to connect with the teacher has really made a difference? Yeah, I have this one student who just won't put her phone down. And it's not because she's misusing it. She's 
completely using it during the instruction. So what she'll do is during during my lecture, she'll record every single thing I say. Um, during my lecture, she'll tweet uh, all these different things um, that 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 stood out to her or um, that she found interesting. And then, on all on her own, she will turn these videos and tweets into an actual story of the day's lesson. And we can put those stories on our website, and those kids who missed out can see a two-minute snippet of everything that we did in class. And um, her insight into what's important about the discussion has been amazing to see that an eighth grade student can pinpoint some of the, the, the more higher level questions that should be asked. And that would never have happened if she was just sitting there listening to me. She, yeah. she, having her being actively involved in the discussion, that gives her buy-in that she is actually helping out the class. And that's, that's what these kids need. They need to know that they are important and they're the ones that drive the class, not me. Yeah, and you know that I think that really touches on an important thing I think about being a connected educator, but also in this case being a connected student, is that if you take your own notes, if you write down your own insights and you keep them in your own notebook or you go file them away in your own filing cabinet, then they sort of go there to die, you know? And all of those things that you have learned, you know, don't get out. Nobody, nobody else gets to see those, but if you put them out on social media and you're able to share them, or if you create a document or a product and you're able to share that, then, you know, then they can live on and on and on, and it makes a big difference for, for you know, potentially people all over the world, don't you think? Oh, ab absolutely. You know, we as, a, as, as educators, we tend to sit back in our walled classroom and we contain the class Everything that happens in the class stays in the class. Everything you learn during the class stays in the class, and it never follows outside. Um, the amazing thing that I've discovered is that um, our um, our school does block periods. So we do um, periods two, four, six on Tuesday and Thursday, and periods one, three, seven on uh, Wednesday and Friday. My Wednesday and Friday kids know exactly what we're doing in class because they are all on their Twitter, they are all on their Instagram, they are all on um, their Facebook. And these kids are just blowing it up with everything that we do, with pictures and discussion questions. And it's just amazing, when they come in, they know everything, because it's like they've already been in the class. Is and that a good thing or a bad thing? I think, think it's an absolute good thing. I, the teachers mm -hmm. tell me, oh, you know, is it okay that the kids know what's going on? I go, you mean, is it okay that students outside the classroom are talking about my classroom? Absolutely, that's a good thing. Yes. You know, who would have thought that eighth grade science would become a uh, uh, a discussion topic um, on you know in the lunch area? That's yeah. ridiculous, and it, and it is, and it's it's pretty amazing to me. Yes, absolutely. And you know, it sounds like um, they're able to do that. I'd imagine through uh, through a class hashtag, right? Absolutely. Yeah, we use hashtag Marquez Science. Marquez Science. Okay, and so that that kind of made me wonder, just in general, about social media, because I know you're you're a connected teacher. Um, you're always learning through social media, like I am. Um, in addition to helping your students get connected, and um, I'm just kind of curious about this whole phenomenon of the hashtag. Um, it's been a, a huge part of Twitter. You know, it's huge on Instagram. Google Plus does it some, and Facebook does it some, and just this whole idea of tags to be able to find ideas and people. Um, I was just kind of curious on your take on how big a deal that is and how how important that is. You know, I'm I'm you know, relatively new to the hashtag. We I only started it once we started using Twitter um, every single day in our class, and I found it's basically like your very own open-ended chat room. Um, and it's it's funny because um, I have been tinkering with co-teaching with a, a, another teacher on my campus, and um, the, we've been using Hangouts on air to do this, and one of the hardest things is to hear another teacher's student ask a question. And the way we've gotten around it is the other teacher now lets their kids use cell phones in class as well during our discussions, and they will hashtag Marquez Science a question, and I will see it instantly. So I don't have to wait for somebody to raise their hand. I don't have to wait for them to ask the other teacher a question, and then the teacher repeat the question. It's real-time, honest answers, honest questions, and now we have 80 kids all at once getting the same material from two different teachers, um, being able to ask questions um, 
in classrooms that aren't connected uh, by any walls, just across campus. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing, which uh, has opened my eyes up to the possibilities of, you know, we no longer have to be secluded teachers anymore. We, we you know, uh, education is, is a collaboration game as it is. And if you can collaborate in real time, I think that will up the game uh, for educators uh, themselves. I mean, we feed off of each other. Um, I know that some of the more senior teachers that I, I listen, to, uh, listen to, listen to their discussions and listen to their lectures, uh, I learn something new every time. And so, you know, utilizing the hashtag has allowed for me to reach more students than I ever thought possible, but also for me to connect with more teachers than I ever thought possible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And we're going to get into that that idea of um, of being able to expand the reach outside of your your classroom a little bit more. And I'm, you know, I'm definitely interested to see how how that all goes. But um, I wondered if you could get into a little bit of the nuts and bolts of the specifics of how kind of like the logistics of how you use social media in a given class period. Like, how do the students use it? How do you use it? Um, you know, just, just some of the some of the basics there. All right, so besides uh, being able to tweet me during my lectures, we utilize uh, Twitter and Instagram during our labs. So um, normally the kids would just have their, we'd have three people in the lab, and it would be a recorder, um, somebody actually doing the lab, and then we ha we'd have somebody else writing down, being the scribe. And now we have a documentarian. And so this person, they're using their either either Twitter account or Instagram account, and they're taking pictures of every single thing they're doing. And they hashtag Marquez Science, and then they put the procedures of exactly what they're doing. And so at the end, they create stories, um, a Twitter story, um, or uh, there's a couple different apps um, that they can use as well that will create a documented procession of what they did in the lab. And they can utilize that documentation to see uh, if maybe a problem occurred. So at the end, the results aren't what they actually wanted. They can go back, watch their videos, watch their posts, and see, oh, we did that wrong. Oh, we did that wrong. So it helps them actually go back and uh, come up with a better conclusion of how they would do the lab better next time or what they did wrong to begin with in the lab um, first off. Have there been any as you've come come through this, and I know this has been sort of a process from beginning to end, and you've probably gone through lots of um, sort of a metamorphosis or a you know a big change of of the way that you do things. But have you had any sort of bumps in the road, any struggles that you've had to work through, and and maybe how how did you get through some of those? Yeah, you know, it's funny. The moment you tell kids they can use their cell phones in the classroom, a lot of them stop using cell phones in the classroom. I mean, there's there's times yeah. that I, I come in and um, after the weekend and I, I, I you know I go onto my tag board hashtag Marquez Science and I, I see that there's not as many people posting their pictures during the labs. There's not as many kids posting their thoughts during my comments. And I have to come in and say, class, I'm very disappointed. You have to start using your cell phones more in class. You know, and their jaws drop and yes. they start laughing because they go, we've never heard a teacher say that. I go, but that's what we do in this class. So that's one bump of the road is getting them to use their cell phones more. Um, they're not used to having their phones out in class and that being okay. So they're still getting used to that fact, and I'm trying to get them to, to, to know, utilize that that's okay. And the part on that I have to do is I have to realize that they're going to misuse their phone as well. And, um, you know, at first I was that teacher that, now, listen, I'm letting you use it for good. If you're using it for bad, I'm going to take it away and be mean. And now I realize, you know, only about 20% of my students are doing doing that, you know, incorrectly. And, you know, I'll mention it to them saying, hey, make sure you're not, not to do that. But I don't point them out anymore because over time that's been happening less and less because they know that I'm not going to go and, and, and beat them down because they're not using it correctly. I mean, they're eighth grade students. They're going to have those those tendencies. But, you know, I have to understand that 80% of the time they're using it for good. You know, focus on the, that 80%. Don't focus on that 20% that they're using it for bad. And that's what a lot of teachers do. They focus on that 20%. I can't stand when kids text during class. I can't stand 
you know, what about the good, that 80%? Stop focusing on the bad. Yeah, so that's I, one of the metamorphoses I had, I've had to overcome is, is understanding it's okay every once in a while that a, a, a kid is, is doing something they shouldn't supposed to. It's going to happen. Don't let that be uh, a, a detour in where you're going. Yeah, you know, I I heard it once um, said. I think it was um, I think it was Todd Whitaker, um, and it may have been in his book What Great Teachers Do Differently, where um, he said something to the effect of Don't make a poster for the two percent of people who are breaking the rule. Absolutely. And instead, let's go talk to those two percent of people and let's get that taken care of, and let's not, you know, let's not chastise the ninety-eight percent, or in your case, the eighty percent that are doing things right, that are getting a lot of good out of the tool. Let's, you know, keep the focus on the good and take care of the take care of the trouble, just kind of individually. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. One, I can't remember who said it at our at at in Austin. They said, you know, kids are going to be doodling. Uh, on their paper with their pencil. Does that mean you're going to go by and take away their pencil? No, no teacher has right. ever thought of going by and taking away a pencil for that. You, no know, you just have to let the, you have to guide the student in a way that they're going to want to use their pencil for good, not not for doodling. And doodling's fine, as you know, as we've talked about. You know, doodling you know helps helps get the mind going a little bit. So I think that's perfectly fine. Yeah, and it's a that that's all all goes back to motivation. Something I've been thinking about a lot here recently is, um, what are we doing with our lessons, with our teaching, with the time that we have with our kids in the classroom to get them motivated to do what we want them to do instead of forcing them through assignments and through you know directions to do what what are we doing to to make them see the connection so that they want to do it on their own? You know. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd imagine, since this is sort of um, sort of forward thinking to bring social media into the classroom, that you've probably had your um, your doubters. I don't know if it's been you know maybe people on staff or parents or maybe even students or anybody. I was just curious to see how much of that you've seen and you know what they've been concerned about and maybe how you've approached that. Yeah, you know, there's there's always going to be the doubters and. Being, you know, the first person to try using social media and try using cell phones in the class, uh, there were a lot of people saying, you know, there were a lot of people on campus who had um, a, a, a complete conniption when they'd see a cell phone even in somebody's class. Uh, if the if the, they heard a vibration in a backpack, they'd send them to the office. You know, they'd no cell phones in my classroom. And uh, I even had to ask permission with my principal because our district has a policy, had had a policy, no cell phones. Um, on campus when when the bell rings, and so I had to get permission from my principal to say, "Let me just try it. Let me just see what I can do. And if it doesn't work, you know, I'll, I'll say I was wrong, and we'll go back to the policy." And a lot of teachers said, "Good luck with that. You know, you're you're gonna have the kids with their cell phones out, and all they're gonna be doing is texting each other." Um, but you know, as they say, the proof's in the pudding. I mean, I've 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 had teachers come in and they they watch how it goes. I've had my LDs come in and they see how engaged and how motivated these kids are. I mean, it's it's unbelievable how much more um, involvement your students have when they know that you're with it, when they know that you're with the time and you're with them and you understand how they learn. Um, it's just amazing, and they, so the teachers are seeing that. Um, now our policy in our district is cell phones may be used in the classroom with teacher's discretion. So I think that's a huge step that our district has taken. Um, are there teachers on campus that are utilizing it as much as me? Absolutely not. I mean, you know, they still just don't have that that faith in the kids that they're going to use it for, for good. But, you know, that's what I say. That's why my test, my room is the, the test classroom. And I, and I tell my students, I say, hey, look, if you're going to, misuse your cell phone, how can I tell the teachers up at the high school that it's okay for them to let them use the cell phones? I mean, exactly. you guys, are, exactly. you guys are, are paving the way for yourselves up there. Do you want classes to be like this, or do you want classes to be uh, like your other classes that you, you aren't as involved in? And they totally understand it. Yeah, um, and 
that's got to be got to be a huge driving force, I would think, in, in making change is to get the kids involved in this culture that you guys want to build. It's like if the kids want to use, if they love being connected through their cell phones, that they love those connections, and they want to make that happen in their school, then they've got to they've got to model it. They're they're by by coming into class every day and using it correctly and doing learning that they couldn't do otherwise, they're setting an example for the other teachers to see and for the other students to see. And I, I love how, how you bring the kids into that because if the kids buy into it and then the teachers see we're getting results and the kids are bought into it and they're not abusing it, it's got to be so hard to, to argue against it, I would think. No, absolutely. You know, and, and my kids are very respectful. They know exactly how to come in with their cell phone. They come into class, they sit down, they take their cell phone out just like they would take a textbook out. Take it out, they place it right on their desk. And I think that's a better place to put it than in their backpack or in their pocket because you know when it's being used. You know where it's at at all times. At the beginning of the school year, whenever I um, talk about this with my staff, I always show the clip from Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom where he's hanging off of the uh, the rope ladder and the 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 stone is burning up in that backpack and starts to fall out. And I say, that stone burning up right there, that's like a, a phone in your kid's backpack. It's, it's on fire and the kids want to get it out and they want to check it. And if you don't let them have it out, that's all their mind is going to be on. It's going to be on, did I just receive a text? Did I just get a Twitter notification? Did somebody just like my post? Was my tweet favorited? They're, they're going to be thinking about that. And when they're thinking about that stuff, they're not thinking about you. They're not thinking about the class. By taking it out and putting it on the desk, all of that goes away. All of that goes away. And um, you get their attention back. And so I show that and they laugh. Some understand it, some don't. But just getting that phone out that you know they're going to want to look at alleviates so many problems in itself. And really, I mean, kids, <laughs> if your students are anything like my students, um, just the, the idea of something being taboo and saying you can't use this, you're not supposed to do this, don't look at this, I mean... It's kind of like saying, don't think about purple elephants. <laughs> exactly. what's, what's the first thing you're going to think about? You're going to think about a purple elephant. Don't think about taking those, those uh, cell phones out. What are they going to think about the whole time? They're going to think, oh, my cell And then if their phone buzzes in their pocket, if they've got it, they're going to go, oh, my goodness, what is going on? Is somebody, is somebody trying to get a hold of me? Maybe this is an emergency. And their mind is going to be totally off of things. That's, that's a great way to think about it. Absolutely. I mean, I, I just finished a lab where I relate Legos to atoms. And the very first thing I do is I place Legos in those old film canisters, those little black film canisters. I place it on everybody's desk, and I say, don't touch it. Don't touch it. And I make them sit there for five minutes not touching it. It's so funny how they're just squirming, and they're trying to – it's it's hilarious. And that's exactly what happens when you say don't take out your cell phone. They can't handle it. Yes. So, yeah, that's a great analogy that you said. That's that's absolutely correct. Yes, yes. Okay, two two more things real quick about Twitter, and then I want to hear about more about this uh, no walls concept that we've been talking about. One is, um, well, let's we'll we'll get down to a couple a couple more nuts and bolts type things. One, um, what are my first question is what are some tools, apps, that kind of thing that you use to facilitate the whole thing? Because people always like to know about the gadgetry behind things. And then secondly, you touched a little bit on um, Google Glass and how that plays into things. And I wondered if you could just just touch on that just a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a few of the things that I use uh, just to keep all my tweets in order. Um, I use uh, TweetDeck um, that comes along with Twitter. Um, that you know, and then there's another one that creates a story out of it. Um, tweet Story. I can't quite remember the name. You're not of it. thinking of Storify, are you? Uh, it might be Storify. Might be. Okay. Um, and then um, uh, Tagboard. I use Tagboard. My kids. Um, I like to put that up on the board during um, our labs. Um, so every time a, a kid uh, hashtags one of their pictures, it goes right up on the, the tag board. And so um, it's amazing when somebody's picture goes up there, another kid wants their picture to go up there. And so you just get a blast of pictures right away. So tag board's been huge during the labs. Um, 
kind of like when you go to a sporting event and it says take a picture and we'll put it up. It's exactly the way it is. Um, those are the main things that I use in, in class uh, to keep tabs on my tweets and to get the kids involved during labs. Okay, and so use TweetDeck probably just to organize the tweets to be able to, to view them and tweet story or storify to um, to capture all that once everything is done and then tag board to display during class, right? Absolutely, yep. Okay, um, the tag board concept I think is great because that means it's right up there in front of everybody and you don't have to be looking down at your phone every time to see what's coming in. Um, I know for me, when I've used, because um, my school district doesn't isn't as liberal yet, hoping that we'll change that, but my school district isn't as liberal with uh, social media yet, and so I, I've used Today's Meet to do some back channels, and... Um, you put that stuff up on the screen, and if somebody puts something up there that's, you know, that's inappropriate or off-topic, and then it starts a little conversation, and I mean, you know, that's that's just sort of human nature to some degree, especially until you learn how to do it correctly. And I was wondering if um, <laughs> I think I, I interrupted you from going on to Google Glass, but uh, maybe you can touch on that real quick on um, how to keep kids focused and to know what's okay and what's not okay. You know, it, it, it comes down to training, training them. You know, you're going to have those kids that want to post something inappropriate. You're going to have those kids that don't post the right thing. Um, fortunately, I haven't had any students uh, do anything too bad. Uh, there's, you know, last year I had a student who would just post random dumb pictures for no reason during our lectures. Um, and I told him, I said, well, number one, you shouldn't be doing that. And number two, you shouldn't hashtag Marquez Science when you do it because you know I'm going to see it. I mean, that's not a smart thing to do. Um, but that's probably the the worst that's ever happened uh, with using Twitter in my class. I don't know if I've been lucky and, and, and um, es escaped that bad part, but uh, I think it all comes down to respect, mutual respect, and that's right away what we talk about in class is we create respect agreements and, you know, I'm here to teach you the best that I possibly can and I'm going to give – everything I can to you and your job is the best possible student you can you're gonna give everything to me and they understand that and that's how the classes run so that's how the tweets are run um, and I, so I think that's why I haven't had any uh, unnecessary tweets um, this year at all very good very good okay and then real quick about about glass um, tell me how that that plays in the class too um, for me glass works very well because I can see the tweet uh, right in front of my face without having to use my hands at all because um, I use um, my yoga um, as my, my tablet. And so whatever I write on my yoga is uh, put on my screen. So I need both hands so I can instantly see somebody's question, instantly answer their question on the board, and just run from there. And I know teachers, you know, the, the glass is expensive, especially right now since it's still basically in beta. Uh, but wearables in general can do the job. If you have a Samsung watch, if you get the new Apple watch, uh, Motorola watches, any type of wearable will give you a notification when you receive a hashtag or a tweet. So, I mean, it's not limited to glass. Um, and the, the reason I think that this has been a very important aspect to uh, the tweet method that I've used in class is because it does give me hands-free mobility to answer questions without skipping a beat. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds great. Okay, so um, to kind of tie back to um, something you were talking about earlier, you said how um, sometimes students in other classes will um, ask a question through your um, through your class hashtag, and then that sort of connects your two classes. And you started to to talk about how that could be just really huge in um, being able to branch out to other classes. And we talked a little bit about this when we were at Google Teacher Academy about the you know, the potential for this if it starts to you know if it starts to reach into other classes in other you know schools in your school district throughout your state I mean potentially even you know throughout the country and the world um, I was just curious to see your sort of your vision on that a little bit you know my vision is that you know and we, we talked about this at the Academy my students are not only my students they they should be able to see any teacher that they want and uh, your students aren't your students. They should be able to see any teacher that they want. So I shouldn't limit, you know, my discussions to just my kids. 
So I, I open it up to, to anybody. So all of my class discussions are live on air. And I do have one other teacher that occasionally jumps on board with me on that. And so I'm teaching two classes at once. So therefore, I can retrieve 80 questions from those different sets of students. Um, I have a student that's on home hospital right now. And she joins us for our live sessions. And she tweets me from her house. So she's still getting the exact same um, experience that everybody else is. I saw a... Um, I think it was a Good Morning America uh, segment on how this one kid's at home, he's got a disease, and his mom works for some company, and so a little robot comes in with the kid's face. Um, not all kids can afford that, but a lot of kids have a cell phone, and they have a computer, so that's, you know, that's the best possible way for them to stay involved while they're away. Over the summer, I help run uh, a laptop camp, and the laptop camp is teaching incoming seventh graders how to use their computers correctly, meaning for educational purposes. And Google Apps for Education is the number one thing that I teach. And when we started doing that, um, all the teachers that have been doing it for a while are only accustomed to teaching the Microsoft products. They were not ready uh, for the Google rollout, especially since we were told only two weeks before that we're switching to Google and not Microsoft. And the teachers were very uncomfortable. And so I brought up the idea of how about uh, I teach it uh, through Google Hangouts. You join the Hangout, and your students can all get the exact same instruction that, that I'm giving my students. And they went along with it, and it worked very well. That was the first year. The second year, we did the same thing, but I incorporated tweeting. I let the kids in the other classes tweet me as well. And so now I could take on uh, 400 students at once. Um, and the teachers loved it because um, all they had to do was walk around and help those students who were falling behind. Um, normally, if you're teaching a computer class, you get those kids that really understand it. But then the other kids that don't, you have to stop, go help them, get them ready. It really creates a stop and go in instruction. The, the, the on-air hangout, with multiple teachers viewing, it's a complete continuous learning cycle that helps both the slow learner and the advanced learner. Um, it's worked out very well. Um, now, in the regular classroom, teachers are more timid. Try it. Um, I do have two teachers who have agreed to beta test with me that are not in science. They've never tried it before, and we've done two sessions of this. And I thought of all the things that could go wrong, but amazingly, none of that occurred. It was amazing to see how smooth and how receptive the students were to have two classes being taught at once. They loved it. They thought it was an amazing thing. Um, I actually recorded a video the other day of our second session of me walking between the two classes and the kids still raising their hands and the kids getting really involved. I'm going to have to share that with you, show you the, share the link of the video, because it's amazing. The kids love it. They're more, they're more willing to listen and, and, and be engaged when they know they're cooperating with other students that they can't see. I, know it's, I, don't, know, I don't know what it is. It must be like a hide-and-seek type of thing. I have no idea, but they, it, it works out really well. Sure, sure. And, you, you know, I've, I've heard people say, and I totally agree with it, that um, kids aren't – addicted to their cell phones because of the cell phones. They're addicted to their cell phones because of the connections that they can make. Absolutely. And I think that's that's sort of what your your class is tying into is it it gets into those connections. You know, if you're familiar with the the SAMR model of um, you know technology integration and you get up to the the high levels of um, redefinition where you're redefining what you can do in education based on the technology, I mean, that's really what this is doing, is it's changing the way that we do education based on these powerful tools, because if you stuck to the old paradigms of education, this stuff that we've always done for so many years, because this hasn't been available or it's been very expensive, um, you know, you're not going to get any of this, but this really opens up the potential for, you know, let's say, you know, if you're a teacher that has a, a really, you know, 
you have a specialization that you're really strong in, if you can sort of like digitally co-teach with another teacher, then you can help them in that area and then the other teacher can help in your area that you're not as, as strong in because that's their specialization. And I mean, it can really play on top of each other, don't you think? No, I mean, across a long, a long distance too. Absolutely. I mean, this, this idea could be huge for brand new incoming teachers because they can have their own classroom but have the safety net of having a veteran teacher show them how they do things. And then as the years progress, the, the, new, the new teacher can build upon that, add their own twists and turns into it. Um, with the new Common Core coming out, um, especially between 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, everything is being switched. Everything. Right now, 8th grade teaches physics, chemistry, and astronomy. And 7th grade teaches uh, biology um, and health. And uh, when Common Core comes out, 7th grade is going to be teaching chemistry. 7th grade is going to teach a little bit of biochemistry. 8th grade is going to be teaching waves and earth structure. I mean, and I'm personally, I'm not... I don't know much about waves, and I don't know much about tectonic plates and earth structure. So if I can have a seventh grade teacher help co-teach with me on that um, or have them teach it now and then I can listen in on how they're doing it to prepare for the next year, I mean, this co-teaching can alleviate so many concerns with elementary teachers and junior high teachers coming in with this new common core idea that they don't feel comfortable with. This will help them as an extra, an extra leg to stand on and feel comfortable in these first few years of Common Core that they won't be so uh, scared of what's coming. And I, I envision like a Google board where a teacher can come into class, click on uh, Google Hangouts for Education, click on Science, and click on Chemistry, and click on ions and see what teacher is teaching about ions that day and then clicking on I'm joining you. I mean, could you imagine an educational atmosphere where you as a teacher can now be teaching to thousands of kids at once with the help of a hundred educators that can chime in and help you? That's mind-blowing to me rather than just being in your own room, in your own solitary little island thinking that you're by yourself. I mean, to me, it just put chill, puts chills up my spine to think of a day that you could physically go into a room digitally and have 100 teachers ready and waiting to teach with you that exact moment. That's amazing. The thing, and another thing that amazes me too is that this could happen right now based on free digital tools that we all have access to. We Absolutely. all have access to Google Hangouts on air. We have access to creating websites that can be a hub for this. We can use social media to connect during the classes and also to, for the teachers to connect with each other to set up the lessons. It's all out there. It's just going to take a concerted effort and and I, I almost think of it as like a marketing campaign, you know, to, to let people know that it exists, some sort of publicity to let them know that it exists to get them on board. And this could really happen, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. It, it all comes down to educators who know how to do this and be willing to get boots on the ground going from teacher to teacher saying, hey, look, can I show you something? Can I show you something that can just open up our district. Let me show you. I mean, that's all it takes. Uh, right now, um, I'm starting small with my science department at Alta and Buchanan just recording live their own lessons, not co-teaching yet. Because once they get the recording part down, the letting somebody join is going to be easy. Um, so baby steps. But it will take a consorted effort from people like you, from people like me, that show the teachers they can have success in utilizing this technology. And as you said, the free word, the, the key word is free. I mean, it's, it's free. You have it. You have access to it. You have a, a GAF account. Let me show you how to use it. Yes, absolutely. So 
are you and you you touched on this I think just a little bit um are you wanting to start sort of like a movement like this and see where it takes off or um, do you know of anybody that's doing this yet or I mean I'm, I'm thinking about if somebody you know sees this or um, you know reads about it on my website and they're they're excited about this what it, what do you suggest that they do uh, I would su I would suggest I mean they're they're more than welcome to contact me we can discuss it as well but I, I would suggest just Running with the idea, I mean, I don't even I don't even care if they th they they say it's their idea and they're running. I mean, just push it forward in their district to see if it can happen. I mean, if if one person in every district across the United States states just took it upon themselves to show their fellow educators what's possible, just imagine what can happen. Little sparks everywhere can create a giant wildfire that can burn across this nation. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. I can't wait to see how this how this all pans out, and I hope I hope that at least for you in your district, this this will take off. And you know, I I mean, with the the vision that you have for this, I could see this really really taking off. So this is this is cool stuff. Yeah, it's very exciting with all the possibilities out there. Yeah. Okay. Um, Joe, tell everybody where um, where they can get a hold of you or where they can they can find out more about you. Uh, you can email me at joemarquez70 at gmail.com. You can tweet me um, at joemarquez70. Um, and um, I guess those are the best two ways to get a hold of me. Um, you can go to my, my blog, uh, tinyurl.com forward slash the paperless classroom, um, where I show you how you can uh, get all this moving uh, in your district. Um, but the best way, uh, just get a hold of me. Um, we can have a video hangout as well and just get this movement going. And <laughs> that, yeah, that, that, that sounds great. My guess is if you have any fellow 49ers fans that are out there that want to commiserate with you about how rough things have been here recently, yeah, you probably talk to them about uh, that too. It's been a difficult year, you know, but it's always next year, I guess. Yes, absolutely. That's, hey, I'm a Cubs fan. I'm used to saying there's always next year. So <laughs> uh, I, I, I feel your pain right there. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, Joe, thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to hang out with us. You got it, Matt. My pleasure.